Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Dr. Dell C. Allison Jr., thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come up here in your home and interview you. Been reading your works and you pay very close attention to detail. Forgive me for the first long question. It's from a Patreon member, Michael Baca. And he says, Derek, below is a question for Dr. Dell, uh, Dr. Dell Allison. Dr. Allison, in your excellent new book on the resurrection of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Criticism, and History on page 240, you state, while visions are indeed associated with certain pathological states, as well as with stress and trauma, they are far from being exclusively <laughs> coupled with such states. Many people have visions of sight or sound or both together without being in any way mentally or physically ill. More specifically, and as documented in chapter seven, there's nothing pathological about seeing the dead. However, one explains the phenomenon. Psychologists now recognize this experience as an almost routine part of bereavement. And the reports I've used herein come not from psych psychiatric hospitals, but from ordinary people. My question, for example, if it is true that bereavement visions are common, how in any way does this demonstrate the veracity of such experiences? What is the point you're trying to make with this type of argument that we should be open to the possibility that there are actual real people that the bereavement are seeing, or as Hamlet says, there are more things in heaven and earth than your philosophy or something else? How does this relate to the disciples' experience of the resurrection? It seems to me that it could be held that these are common human experiences. My parents have mentioned to me similar experiences, but it seems that there is an extensive literature in psychology about abnormal experiences that doesn't require positing the supernatural to explain these things, just normal human psychology under abnormal conditions. I'm not claiming that you are doing this in this chapter, but otherwise I don't follow the point you're trying to make in this chapter and other numerous examples you have of abnormal experiences that have been documented in the present and past and how they might relate to the resurrection appearances in the gospels. That was a really long one. <laughs> okay, so let me try to unpack that. First of all, I do want to emphasize um, the issue of pathology because it's still the case that most people think when you have a vision that it's pathological or abnormal or something, something is wrong with you, something is amiss. And that's a huge mistake. And I do think, uh, so to speak, on a pastoral level, it's really important that people get over that and, and recognize that people have visions. Now, the real question here is, uh, is there any evidence or reason to believe that some visions are more than just subjective projections? And I've been convinced for a long time that maybe they are. Now, some of this has to, be, has to do with my own personal experience because I have had visions. My wife has had visions, all three of my children have had visions, and none of us are um, mentally uh, unstable or abnormal. And when we have had these visions and talked about them and tried to process them, it hasn't been obvious to us that in each and every case we are simply hallucinating in the, the ordinary sense of the, the term. And my suspicion that more might be going on here um, has been confirmed by the fact that if you read the so-called parapsychological literature, you will find that there are tons of cases in which somebody says, I saw a dead person, oh, and by the way, someone else was in the room with me, and we both saw it. Um, there actually was a recent study, it just came out last week, something like 20% of people who um, in this study reported bereavement visions, said somebody else was in the room and they saw it too. So if more than one person is seeing something at the same time, then the simple-minded, it's a hallucination uh, resolution, uh, doesn't, doesn't get it. Now, I actually don't know what the heck is going on. So if I posit um, that there are such things as veridical visions, that doesn't mean I understand them at all. I tend to think that all perception uh, is projection, 
That is, if you, if you read the scientists, they say that, you know, electromagnetic waves come into your eyes and then those get turned into chemical signals and then you reproduce something somehow magically uh, in your brain and then it feels like you're projecting it back onto the world. Uh, I, I've been puzzled by the problems of perception for a long time. I don't really know philosophically how to uh, demonstrate the fact that we actually perceive something that's out there, that's, that's objective. I tend to think it's all projection, but somehow it's projection that matches things that are there. So in the case of a vision, I uh, am open to the possibility that just as we can see things in response to electromagnetic uh, input, so maybe there are other channels and that we can then respond to them by projecting uh, a vision, but it's not uh, in response to our pure su subjectivity. And one reason for thinking this, even though I'm, I'm not giving you an explanation at all because I've been thinking about this for decades and I still have no idea what the heck is going on, is that if more than one person seems to uh, report um, seeing the same thing at the same time, and at the same time it's not there, right, but they are both seeing it, then I have to ask what the heck is going on. And if I think this happens in the modern world, then I have to have an open mind about other times and places. And then the other thing is, is that I have a whole chapter where I look at, among other things, bereavement visions or visions of the dead, and I catalog the parallels between what's going on in the New Testament accounts and what's going on uh, in the Gospel accounts. And one of the things that I think I can do, even if it's all subjective, is I can say, I think some of these go back to real experiences because they match real experiences today, however explained. So it's one, uh, so, so I guess there are three issues involved. One is pathology. I, I care about that a lot because I'm not crazy and I've had visions. Um, the, the second is history. Is there some history? Is there some memory in these accounts? Well, to the extent that they agree with other accounts that I know to be or believe to be historical, that ups the odds. And then finally, is there the possibility of anything extra subjective or paranormal or you know, whatever word you want to use? And I think, again, from looking at the modern world, um, yeah, maybe so, all right? Uh, but, but I also want to emphasize here, I don't see any way to prove that the disciples had objective visions. I mean, one of the... Uh, sad conclusions in that book is that I can't do as much as I, I want to do and that I think both the skeptics and the apologists uh, fall short in their, their arguments, which ends, ends you up in an unhappy place that most people don't like, but um, the, the experience of visions falls, falls into that. Because of course people can see things that are not there and people can simply um, project uh, if I may compliment you about your opening chapter, there's one thing, as a skeptic, I'm not a hater, like I want to say that up front for the Christians who may be watching this interview, um, even if I have serious doubts about all of it, like I, I wonder if we'll be able to naturally explain these things someday, and it's like, mm -hmm. we just didn't understand it then, but that still wouldn't take away its meaning. I, I, I want to emphasize this, but in the opening of your book, you said... You know, when you get done with this book, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be happy. And if you're a skeptic, you're not going to be happy because there's a book that should be written that will never be written. And it's, it's something that you wish you were able to, like you said. I have much respect for what you did by writing in this book and saying, I'm going to do my best based on even having my faith. Like, there are Christians who probably wish you wouldn't say some of the things you say, right? And there are atheists who wish you were saying more yeah. and, and mm -hmm. you're never going to satisfy them. You are your own man and that's what you present in this book, I think. Well, I, I guess thank you. Um, but when, when really intelligent, well-informed people come to different conclusions about a difficult subject, you might conclude that we're never going to have any unanim unanimity ab about it. And sometimes we just have to, to live with things like that. And um, for whatever psychological reason having to do with my mother upbringing or whatever, I'm okay with uh, uncertainty, uh, I'm okay with doubt, I'm okay with changing my mind, but a lot of people need to have, maybe, yeah, I don't want to get ad hominem here, but it appears to be that lots of people prefer to have uh, solid conclusions um, 
And that's actually what an apologist is trying to do, say, you know, all the evidence really does show this, or a skeptic, all the evidence really shows that. And I'm sort of in between saying there are good arguments on both sides, and there are possibilities on both sides, and there are additional possibilities beyond what the apologists and the skeptics are, are, are thinking. Thank you, I appreciate it.